Welcome to the Woman Inc. podcast. This is the place for the new generation of women looking to lead the life of their absolute dreams. I'm your host, Jenna Toddy, entrepreneur, life coach, and strategist for modern businesswomen and entrepreneurs. I am a city girl, sriracha lover, and that friend who will hype you up when you forget how powerful you truly are. I am on a mission to make Women Inc. the most powerful network of women who are leveling up, owning what they want, and becoming who they've always wanted to be. Have you ever wondered what it would look like if you went all in on yourself? No turning back. If so, you are in the right place place, my girl. Let's get started. Hello, my beautiful Woman Inc. listeners. I am so excited to introduce you to today's guest. Elizabeth Jones Hennessy is the founder and CEO of Gift Me Chic. If you haven't heard of the e-commerce platform, it is my new favorite place to find the most gorgeous gifts. I pride myself on my gift giving abilities. So I loved our conversation around curating the site and her mindset behind building a gift focused company with brands from around the world. Elizabeth has an incredibly impressive background. She is a former buyer for luxury retailers, including Bergdorf Goodman and Saks Fifth Avenue, and was the first to exclusively launch Killian Perfumes in the United States, later becoming the CEO of Killian Perfumes for North America. You can find Elizabeth on Instagram at Elizabeth Jones Hennessy and at Gift Me Chic. Now, let's get over to my conversation with Elizabeth. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I've been very excited for this interview. Yeah, thank you for having me. You have a very cool background. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like selfishly very interested in your background because I don't know if you know this, but I had a showroom in New York for five years. worked with buyers all the time. So I know how amazing and competitive and cool your job experience is. So I kind of wanted to start there, if you don't mind, just before starting your company, which of course we'll get into what your experience leading up to becoming an entrepreneur. Of course. Yeah. Um, You know, so it is a bit of a long history (laughs) leading up, but it's a snapshot, you know, because I'm not that young, but... (laughs) But um, no, but I mean, my career, my, you know, my career definitely prepared me for where I am now. I spent six years at Saks Fifth Avenue as a buyer. I then spent almost four years at Bergdorf's as a buyer. I left Bergdorf's to open the U.S. subsidiary and become the CEO of North America for Killian Perfumes. And then when the brand was acquired by Estee Lauder back in 2016, that was for me the moment where I said, okay, what am I going to do? I thought about my own business. It had always been my dream to launch my own store, have my own store. But it took a little while to make that leap. You know, I did a few things in between consulting and writing and then I launched this past year. So it's been, you know, a 20 year track really of of getting to this place in my life, in my career. Yeah. And I mean, you say that so casually. I was the CEO. (laughs) (laughs) But that is such an amazing jump. You went from being a a buyer at a department store to just being the CEO and launching like one of the most well-known perfume brands. I feel like, how did that happen? Like, how did you go from being a buyer to launching this brand and then also being their CEO? Yeah. I mean, at that time, so I had actually launched Killian Perfumes exclusively in the US at Bergdorf's. So this is back in 20, 2007 and business took off right away. It was very exciting. Um, and for a year, I worked with Killian, the owner, to really build up the Bergdorf's business. And at the time, um, he was looking for another department store to you know, work with, whether it was Neiman's or Saks. And when Saks came along, it was interested in picking up the brand. He didn't really know how to do that because he was based in Paris. Um, He didn't have any team on the ground in the US. And he basically said to me, Elizabeth, you're one of the few people I know and I really trust professionally. And on top of the fact I had come from Saks, so I knew the whole buying team. I had been in beauty there. So 
you know, for him, I made perfect sense. For me, it really was a leap because I had worked in wholesale in the very beginning of my career before Saks. But you know, in life, you see a train passing. And I always give this analogy because it's, it is really those moments where you say, okay, am I going to get on the train or am I going to let it pass? And at that time, I was going through some personal changes and it just felt like the moment, you know, like I'm starting a new chapter in my life personally and professionally. Hey, let me just dive into this dark pool. <laughs> And see what happens. And it was very small at that time. You know, at that time, it was just Bergdorf's. We started launching sack stores and started with four stores on the West Coast. And I knew that business. I knew how to open a store. I knew what Saks team was looking for in terms of a business partner. So it really was, um, I eased into it in a very natural way. And then over the course of eight years, that's when the job, you know, really became a bigger CEO role because at that time we were launching almost all of the SAC stores and there was 45 of them at the time and Holt Renfrew in Canada and Saks in Mexico and specialty stores. So it's something that it really, um, I ramped up as time went on and I knew how to do it. You know, I know at that point of being a buyer for so long, I knew how to run a business. I knew how to run a P&L and open to buy, building up the team. So again, it was really step-by-step. Step. So I know everyone's like, wow, how'd you make that jump? But it, you know, I don't think people realize that when we launched, it was, we were really small, you know, and it took time to get there. Yeah. Right. And I feel like buyers, such incredible visibility over so many different parts of the business. You guys juggle so much that it makes sense to me because I understand the business, but yeah. on paper, it does look like a jump, which I think is really exciting. But I love the train analogy. And I was thinking when you were saying that, how do you become the person who jumps on the train? Because I know so many younger girls who want to start their own business and they have this desire like, wow, I would love to make that jump, but I'm so terrified. What wow. do you think within you gave you the courage to do that? Well, I guess there's two different jumps, right? So there's the jump from retail to wholesale, which is what that was at that time. And then there's the b even bigger jump that I made to launch Gift Me Chic. So, you know, back at the time, at that time, I saw the opportunity, you know, I said, okay, I lo I've loved being a buyer. I did love being a buyer, um, which is why I'm back in retail now. But I was really excited about the brand. I was really proud of the brand. I had brought it to the US. I had launched it successfully at Bergdorf's. You know, professionally, it was a really big opportunity for me. So I really just trusted my instincts. I saw the potential and I made the jump. Now, if we're talking about, you know, give me chic, yeah, let's that's get it. a lot longer, you know, that really did. And that was really scary. It took a lot of soul searching. <laughs> it took a lot of, of support from a dear friend of mine is also so professional coach. And so I worked with her on numerous occasions and I was, you know, going through your questions and we did exactly with some of the things you referred to, you know, a vision board and talking about my dreams. And, and then I really had to get over the social conditioning from my parents. They both have been our very hard workers. They always had very secure jobs with 401ks and pensions and health insurance and all of that. And I've always admired them and got my work ethic from them, but neither were entrepreneurs. So that for me was like, oh my God, this is a big risk. I'm not going to have a 401k, you know? <laughs> and I really had to fight my own fear and find the courage and the confidence. And that didn't happen overnight. The family programming <laughs> is so real. So yeah. real. Okay. So getting into Gift Me Sheet, how did okay. the idea first come to you? So I knew that, again, when Killian was acquired and I had this opportunity to sort of think about what did I want to do next, because I'd always loved retail and I, or my, my most exciting, let's say, professional days were as a buyer and finding new products and being out in the market, being in the showrooms, places like you were at and being out in the world, discovering new brands and being in different cultures, thrill of discovery. And so I held on to that really tight and I'm like, okay, I know this is what I love. Now, how do I take this to the next level. In looking at the landscape, brick and mortar stores are really hard. So I knew that wasn't the right direction to go. And I started doing some research and looking at rents and what kind of business model that would be. And of course, I'm like riddled with fear, you know, <laughs> They're like, okay, so it has to be e-com because as we know, this is the future. And then when I looked at the space of 
what's out there. I mean, I love fashion. I love accessories, but it's a really crowded landscape. You know, I'm not going to compete with Net-A-Porter and not to say I couldn't, but it felt like a leap. <laughs> and, and I just felt like that space was really oversaturated. So when I started to think about myself shopping online, what would make my life easier? What kind of things do I want, you know, when I'm shopping? And then it kind of, as I thought more and more about it, I got to this idea of, finding a gift and how hard it can be. And sometimes, you know, if you go to a department store online, you have to weed through thousands of products just to find something that could be an option. Or you go to the mom and pop store around the corner in your neighborhood, and you can always find some cute things and tchotchkes and this and that. But for me, I didn't have one go-to destination where I trust their assortment. I love their brands. I knew who was behind it. And for me, that's what I saw was missing in this space. And I felt that that was the opportunity. Also, someone like me that has the professional background, it's not a vanity project. It's like, this is my career. I know how to do this. But taking it into e was where it became like, okay, now I have something very new to learn or new for me. But really, that's how the idea of the gifting platform was formed. And then one day I was sitting in an airport and I'm thinking about it and I'm writing my journal and it just came to me, give me chic. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, and it just, it clicked. It's like one of those aha moments. And I'm like, this is it. I got it. I found it. And I quickly, I think in the airport, literally went to GoDaddy or Network Solutions and bought, found the URL. It was available. I went to Instagram. I got the handle. And I was like, okay, this is meant to be. The fact that these things are even available was a miracle in and of itself. That was back in 2019. So this is something that's been developing since then. Because I started really, really small as kind of a test, like a little bit of a project back when I launched 2019, I got 10 brands. I said, okay, you know what? Let me just start 10 brands. I had my wish list. I went out to them. I got them on board. I gave them a deal financially. They couldn't pass up, frankly. <laughs> and I just saw what the interest could be and started, you know, working my network and putting together newsletters. And, um, you know, I don't have, a, I didn't have a big budget and I don't have a big budget. So it wasn't like I could put all this money to marketing. So again, I was kind of creeping along and then I got such amazing feedback and there were so many more brands that I was seeing and wanting to join or were contacting me and saying, Hey, we heard about give me chic. We'd love to be a part of it. And then it started to snowball and get, you know, bigger and more robust until I had this more of an official hard launch in November of 2020. That was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love it. And I know that feeling when you see that your name is available. It's the best feeling ever. <laughs> That's such a good name. So you launch and then shortly after we run into pretty crazy year. Um, what yeah. did what did that look like for you in the early stage of building a business and you can't meet with people in person and like trade shows are down how did you start building these relationships yeah so that's that was interesting <laughs> so you know again 2019 was super small i had these 10 brands but those 10 brands gave me a great platform because most of them were fairly known brands like Asseline and Fleur de Mall and Killian, for example, Page Novik Jewelry, and then a few smaller things that were more unique, exclusive, but it was a good mix. And so in 2020, okay, in January, the show, Maison and Objet show, did happen because we weren't quite there yet with COVID. So, and that show is always my favorite. It's in Paris. It's twice a year, January and September. And you have brands from all over the world. It's humongous. There's eight halls. It takes like five days just to get through the whole thing. So this was great because it got me, I already, I met a ton of new brands, started talking to them, getting that conversation going. So then in February, March, when we started the pandemic, I already had some wheels in motion. So that really helped. And then through the course of 2020, it was more of an opportunity for me to really build it out in the way that I wanted to, knowing that it wasn't going to be a huge thing. And because of what's happening in the world, it was a blessing in a car. 
first because obviously I wanted the business to take off right away, but I was able to go slower knowing that it wasn't going to happen like that. So I was able to start onboarding the brands from Maison and Objet. And then it became like this really cool kind of word of mouth. I have some friends who live in Paris, but they're Norwegian. And there were, you know, one of them was like, hey, Elizabeth, we know this great stationary brand. Or another one's like, hey, I have no great hand. So that's just one example. But I trust my friends and my friends, most of them have great taste. And so I started getting a lot of networking through them. And then I have to say Instagram, you know, I know there's like this love hate relationship with Instagram, but I've been able to source and find some really interesting brands. Um, and so that's kind of how it, I was able to keep pulling it together through the course of 2020. And then for me, the other really important and big part that I'm really focusing on now in the business are experiences because you know, okay, there's one thing that's great to send someone a product gift and you receive it and it feels so special, but we can't see each other. You know, we can't be together. So we started conceptualizing this idea of gifts that were happening virtually. So we started putting together some things like first we have a virtual wine tasting or we have a bespoke crystal reading with Paige Novick, a jewelry designer and crystal healer started doing a cooking class. So all of these little things started to come together to create this world of experiences that ended up becoming really great sellers through 2020 because it was a great way for people to connect and interact if we couldn't be in person. I'm really excited because we just added a tarot reading. We added an astrology reading. We added another cooking class with the three-star Michelin chef. Now it's really building out because obviously there's still the beauty in receiving a physical gift, but there's also this, this idea that gifts can now come in all shapes and forms and don't have to be a physical product all the time. I love that. I need to go on this. Those are all of the things I'm so into. <laughs> Yeah, no, me too. We just got the tarot and this and the astrology up. And I'm like, and these are the I will say too, these are all services that I know and that I trust. The astrologer we just put up has been my astrologer for 10 years. I mean, he's he's changed my life in some ways. And so it's like all of these things for me, it was really about being authentic and making sure that every experience were with people I know, people I trusted. And so the customer would have the absolute best experience because I know because I've had it, you know. Yes, that's a, that's a very good point that I think actually isn't talked about a lot. When you are launching a business, I feel like the first instinct is to look to other people and how they're running it and you trying to say, okay, how does this brand work? How does this company work? But being able to stay true to yourself in this process and stay authentic when you feel maybe like imposter syndrome, like I haven't done this before. Have you dealt with that at all in building this? I definitely have. I mean, especially when it comes to e-commerce and just learning, you know, all of the backend stuff and haven't even scratched the surface. There's so much to learn. Basics of Shopify even and MailChimp and all the different services we're using to run the platform. But luckily what I've done is I've put together a team. It's a small team at that, but it's a team that everyone has their own skill set. So we all are doing what we need to do to come together with each of our own areas of expertise to then become a united front <laughs> to, to keep the <laughs> you know, keep the train moving back to the train analogy. It really does take so many different skill sets to run a business in general, but I feel like an online store with Shopify alone, there is so much to it. Yeah, there is, especially with 30 brands, over 30 brands, you know, because there's the all of the curation of the product and getting all the products on the site. And then of course, just the partnerships with the vendors. Okay. So I feel like a lot of people who want to start online stores, they have no idea where to start. Can we touch just for like a minute, the operation side, which I know doesn't really seem exciting, but I feel like these are the things that people really want to learn about. When you first sign a brand, what is the first thing that you do? Can you walk through that process a little bit, just high level? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Luckily, Shopify really does make it easy. I wasn't familiar with it before, but it's really intuitive. You can pick things up really fast. The first thing I do is I need to make sure that the brand is either on Shopify or WooCommerce or Squarespace or one of the platforms that Shopify can connect with. We have an app that connects Shopify to a number of other platforms. And in doing so, it enables us to connect with their backend. So let's say Paige Novick, I'm going to talk about her for a second, Jewelry. 
So we connected our back ends and then we're able to go into the app and pull her entire catalog of products. So I say to my team, okay, we're doing curation. I want to focus on her gem story necklaces and I want 10 earrings. I'm just making this up. So we're able to go in her back end, pull what we want, and it automatically transfers over to our site. So the imagery, the product information, everything. So from the back end operational standpoint, that's how it happens just to get them up. But then there's the negotiation with the brand. So it's kind of like, okay, what is your business model? Are you buying the stock? Are you holding it on consignment? Is it drop ship? And then based on all of that, what are the terms that you've negotiated in terms of the margin or the commission split, the payment terms? So there's sort of these two sides of it, which is the business and then making sure that that's buttoned up. And then the operational part of uh, logistics of getting the brand on the site. I was going to ask you next about negotiations. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the question I get asked the most is yeah. women in particular feeling uncomfortable in general with negotiating and asking for money, asking for certain terms. And then if someone sends them, say, an offer coming back and trying to present a better offer for themselves. It just feels unnatural for a lot of the women who I talk to. What advice would you give for this? Because being a buyer, you have to be a good negotiator and starting your own business. You do. Yeah. And I think for me, I've really, the 10 brands that I launched with, I really gave them an amazing deal because I wanted them on the site. And it was a way for me to get started. You know, the deal I gave them, they couldn't say no, really. And they love the concept. So of course, that was the, also the impetus for them to get involved. And then I started bringing on new brands. And I said to myself, from a financial perspective, I can't afford <laughs> the model that I gave these 10. But what I did is I said to these 10, I'm going to grandfather you in. So they always will have those terms unless I work out a different sort of deal with them, but that's another story. So then what I've done is over the course of the year, I've worked with various brands to make the terms for me better. And I've made them better and better along the way. Now I'm at the point where I'm at the level that I know I need to be at from a financial standpoint. And if a brand can't adhere to that, I say no. There was one brand I really wanted and we went back and forth and back and forth. And I finally just had to say no. And I said, I'm so sorry. You know, I'd love to work with you and things change from your end in the future. Let's reconnect. But at the end of the day, you have to do what's right for you and your business model. And if it's going to, if you're going to lose money, then it has to be a no, as hard as that is sometimes. Right. Yeah. So there's two parts I in my brain this is how I see it maybe because I'm yeah. obsessed with personal development and all of that but there's building the business and then there's building the entrepreneur and yeah. you said you've worked with a coach so I know you've done work to just build yeah. yourself as a woman and someone who can run a business are there any things that you have done or do in your daily life that support you personally and and have helped in your personal development? From a business standpoint, I learned very early on, never burn a bridge. And it's been very important for me over the years in my various roles to always learn from the people I'm working for, working with. And if it happens naturally, keep them in my network. Always have positive relationships with people. And this has been a big, big piece of getting to where I am, finding that courage because I've reconnected over the years with, for example, former bosses from SAC, a boss from one of my first jobs, people in the industry who know me, believe in me, have their own amazing experience that I can draw from. And it's been incredible, the support and encouragement I've received from all of these people around me, because after 20 years, they know my work ethic. They know what I can do. Having all of that encouragement around me from all of these professionals that I've so trusted, that's what helped me jump off the cliff or whatever, you know, it, it really did. Because it's like, if all of these people believe in me and and tell me I can do this. Why, why don't I believe in myself? Yes. You know, 
Yeah. So that's like the mental block. But I think using your network and using the people you've worked with to help you figure it out and help you get there and picking their brains is such an important piece of what has gotten me to where I am. I love that. I don't know if I answered the question, but. <laughs> no, you, no, you totally did. I think it's so subjective. And I love that. It's so true that people can see in ourselves something that we don't see. Yeah. Uh, and that also speaks to who you're surrounding yourself with which sounds like very good yeah. people. <laughs> it's very important. Yes. Positive energy all the time. <laughs> as yeah. much as possible. <laughs> as much as possible. Soak it. Yeah. All. So we, you touched on this a little in the beginning with the vision boards, but when you get a new idea for something in the business, how do you kind of manage within your team how to make it a reality? Well, if you look at my desk, you'll see it's like organized chaos. I literally have <laughs> papers everywhere because I'm a note taker. Totally old school. I have a notebook where I just write down ideas all the time, conversations, I'm taking notes, and I have an immediate idea. I grab a post-it, I put it on my desk. It's again, it's a bit mad, but I know where everything is. And I and my team and I sometimes we're talking and things will just click and we'll say, oh my God, let's do that, let's do that, let's do that. For example, I'm looking at my browser and I was talking to someone on my team yesterday and we said, wouldn't this be such a good idea? And, um, and we came up with it and I opened up the tab on my computer and I left it there. And it's a way for me to know, okay, don't forget, you have to go back to that, you know? So there's, there's a method to the badness. Um, <laughs> I mean, I am, I, I am a very organized person. You wouldn't think it if you're looking at where I am right now, but, um, you know, but that's kind of how I, how I make, pull it all together, you know? And again, having a team that helps me pull it all together. I am pulled in a number of directions. So it's important to have people around you that can help you support, support, support. <laughs> Completely. I, Manisha, who I think you spoke to a bit with email, she's always like, I'm so sorry. I'm stalking you. I'm like, no, you have to, because if I don't respond, I'll forget to respond. So you have to keep because yeah, yeah this okay. email gets the oil, you know? Yeah. Yes. So are you guys all working from home then right now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how is that yeah. going? How are you guys connecting every day? Well, you know what? We always have been working from home because I'm such a small team and then COVID hit. So it's actually been fine. There's no, we don't necessarily need to be together. We do everything over Zoom or on the phone. Each have our tasks. We're on text message all day. You know, the times we come together in person and now thank goodness we are vaccinated. So it makes it easier is when we have to do photo shoots or collecting samples for something. So there's moments that we come together, but otherwise it's it's kind of okay. And it's so funny. I've been working on a four-year financial plan and I said to my strategist, well, did you put an office <laughs> space in there? And he said, I think we put it in for like 2024 or something really far. And I said, Th that might even come out. I mean, who knows at what, you know, what the future will hold in terms of going back to an office. Yeah, I know it's very, very crazy. I yeah. interviewed a girl who had hired people. She's never met yet. They're fully on her team, but because it was during COVID, she's, they have everything's over zoom. Yeah. So for the future of Gift Me Chic, what are you most excited about? Oh my gosh, there's so much to do. I mean, I really feel like I've barely scratched the surface. I go back to this net a porte idea because I'm personally such a huge fan of the site. I've been shopping on it for years. I love how they've grown the business. The same day delivery is just genius. <laughs> and, you know, customer service and all of that are things I know that I'd love to put into place. Number one, I'd say first and foremost is marketing. I really need more support from a financial standpoint. So I'm going out soon to look for that. And then the majority of that has to go into marketing, just getting the word out there. And then once that happens and we start getting traction, there's things that I do want to implement. You know, if one day I can do same day delivery for my customers, that's ideal because if you're going to a dinner party and you need a gift, something, a small token, and to have it delivered that day is ideal. Personal shoppers for a customer to call and say, oh my gosh, you know, it's my wife's birthday, help guide me. And they can do that on the phone with additional assistance than just going on the site. There's, there's so, so much. It's exciting. I'm trying to walk before I run <laughs> and it's hard sometimes because, you know, I'm impatient. I'm like, oh my God, we're not doing this. We're not doing that. And I'm like, okay, slow down, breathe. Look at what you are doing. Look how far you've come so far. You just 
breathe, <laughs> be in the moment, and then think about the future, be strategic about the future, make my wish list, but know that it's not going to happen overnight. Yes. I think yeah. that's very important. And also you started in 2019 and you are doing such an amazing job. So <laughs> outsider looking in, you're killing it. <laughs> I really that. Thank you. Okay. So last question, which I ask everyone, what would be your number one piece of advice to a woman who's wanting to start her own business? I think first and foremost, it's about doing some homework Really, what is the business you want to start? What does that business model look like? What do you need to get that off the ground? Is it financial support? Is it team support? Is it knowledge in that area, that expertise? I think gaining as much knowledge as you can on whatever it is you want to do is the most important. So just so you have, you're never going to know it all, obviously, but you need to have some semblance of what you're about to leap into. And then once you've done your homework and you feel comfortable with this idea, even more so, then again, it takes finding the courage within yourself, you know, having the confidence saying, I can do this. And then putting the building blocks together to try to make it happen. And again, I think it's about being patient. If you have a genius idea, but you still need to pay your bills, you know? So it's like, keep your day job and do it at night or on the weekends in your spare time. So I think there has to be a balance of being realistic about your life and how much you can juggle and what you need to put food on the table and pay your rent, but also then believing in yourself and building what it is that you're passionate about. And then one day ease out of the day job and ease into the dream and go about it in a smart and strategic strategic way as you can to protect yourself. Yeah. You know, it's scary. It's really scary, but it's also so exciting and so invigorating. These are all normal feelings. I encourage people to take the leap, but be smart about it in the process. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this episode and are feeling so fired up to go out there and create that business or side hustle that's been on your to-do list, you know, a little bit longer than you care to admit. It is never too late to make the first step towards the life you want more than anything else. If you haven't already, make sure you are subscribed to the show so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, keep becoming the woman of your wildest dreams.